Welcome back to Plot Pit. I'm one of your two hosts, William Atkinson, here with John LeMay. And today we have very special author friend of ours on the phone, Jesse F. Lawrence, who's written three books, I Nano, Day After Infinity, and Metal. Soon to be released, he has an audible version of Metal. Uh, audible versions are also available for the other two books mentioned. Let's start, Jesse, with an introduction of you. Why don't you let us know who you are and a little bit about yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Jesse. Uh, I am currently an author of sci-fi novels slash apocalyptic novels, and I really started writing a few years back and love it. And I keep learning, and one of my favorite things to do. Excellent. Tomorrow we have an author interview. We'll dive deeper into your work, your style, and that, I'm sure, will prove to be fascinating. Today in the pit, John, what have you brought? We've got Atmospheric Beasts and Reigns of Blood. Atmospheric Beasts and Reigns of Blood in the first part of an author trilogy with Jesse Lawrence. Let's begin the descent. John, introduce us to Atmospheric Beasts and raining blood yeah raining blood sounds kind of apocalyptic and atmospheric beasts are definitely sci-fi so hopefully this will fit in jesse's wheelhouse yeah so this is uh the yeah the part of the show that you know some of our listeners i think really enjoy the facts and the folklore so to speak and so this this will be that portion of the show atmospheric beasts are kind of hard to describe and quantify but carl sagan you could say believed in them. He didn't believe they were in Earth's atmosphere. He believed they were a possible life form in the gaseous, I guess, skies over Jupiter. He thought that was a possibility. So, but an atmospheric beast is thought to be just this kind of sometimes translucent floating creature. Sometimes they're kind of ethereal or jelly-like and they just kind of float through the atmosphere. They don't really have wings and they're a complete and total mystery. I mean, they're basically a, a cryptid Although you could almost call it like an astro cryptid, I suppose, because they're kind of otherworldly. And we're gonna we're gonna cover about two different ones to try and just choose from what we think will work best to kick off our story. One we've done before, which is the Crawfordsville monster. Oh yeah, that was fun. Yeah, so I th- I feel like uh, even though we've kind of done it before, we'll we'll be a little more traditional with it this time. So we'll we'll start with that one. Now Carl Sagan believed that atmospheric beasts were potential life form that would exist in places like Jupiter? That's correct, Jupiter. And I'm sure Venus would probably be another one because it's kind of like a hot gaseous type planet. Correct, yes. I, I did not realize that that was something somebody as recent as Carl Sagan would potentially buy into. Yeah, and so to really backtrack from our more modern expert Carl Sagan to go into the past, we're gonna start with Charles Fort. Fort was born in 1874. And then I think about in his 30s, he started to go through the newspapers just looking for the weirdest articles he could find and you know as i've said many times before on this show a lot of those articles were made up for entertainment and fort was kind of like me he wanted to see which ones were just made up and which ones might be real one that really caught his eye was the so-called crawfordsville monster incident of september of 1891 it was so unbelievable fort thought it was probably a hoax and fort tracked down one of the surviving witnesses a reverend switzer and he was shocked to learn that switzer was a real man and switzer said it all happened just as they said in the article so we'll we'll read a few quotes from the article so the uh, version i'm quoting from came from the crawfordsville daily journal of september the september the 5th 1891 And so here's this, uh, I don't know if we'd call this fact or folklore, it's a little bit of both, but so this Crawfordsville monster, they described it as uh, just this creature that was, quote, swimming through the air in a whirling, twisting manner, similar to the glide of uh, snakes or serpents. They saw it kind of swoop down close to the earth, and some people think it was a flock of birds just because it had these weird moving fins, but we'll quote again from the article. So Shortly after midnight, Reverend Switzer stepped into his back door yard to get a drink at his well. As he stood there, a strange, weird sensation crept over him, and although he is unable to say whether he was attracted by any sound or not, he suddenly felt his attention drawn upward, and raising his eyes with the full expectation of beholding something, he saw what both puzzled and astonished him. That night was very dark and very still, no breath of air stirring, but propelled by some unseen force he saw sweeping towards him from the southwest the apparition. It was about 16 feet long and 8 feet wide, resembling a mass of floating drapery. 
shaped like a fleecy milk white cloud or a demon in a shroud. I just now realized that rhymes, so I, I guess the uh, reporter was kind of having a little bit of fun with the article. And that could be why our esteemed science guy thought this was a made-up article. Yes, yeah. And it, I mean, again, it, it defies description. So, okay, continuing the article. It was much too low to be a cloud and moved far too swiftly. Besides, there was no wind at all. It seemed to work about as it swam through the air in a writhing, twisting manner similar to the glide of serpents. Switzer called his wife out to observe, and just as the being was east of the church, it began to descend and seemed to land in the yard of a Mrs. J.M. Lane. They lost sight of it for the moment, but Switzer, proceeding into the street, saw it arise again, and he and his wife watched it circle about the town for some time, finally tiring and going into the house with the strange phenomena still visible. So again, Switzer was the most famous witness, but there were others who saw it as well. They described it as pure white with no definite shape or form, resembling somewhat a great white shroud fitted with propelling fins. And so the fins is why some people think it was a flock of birds. But uh, they say there was no tail or head visible. There was one great flaming eye and a sort of wheezing noise that it made from its mouth. And uh, it flapped like a flag in the wind as it came on and frequently gave a great squirm as though suffering unutterable agony. So that's the Crawfordsville monster. I don't think we need to uh, read too much more on it just because we've covered it before. And uh, I think that's about enough. So if I remember right, um, February 16, episode 16, it's our Shoemaker Levy 9, A Great Flaming Eye and the Crawfordsville Monster course we have covered this particular incident a couple of times on the show but folks if you're interested episode 16 we actually really dive into it it's fun yeah and this next well it's not a creature it's creatures plural is a lot stranger it's kind of they've been described before as like clams from outer space it's a really weird one um now what troubles me about this story is it was unearthed and discovered in the 1950s. Now, supposedly it took place in the 20s, but the 1950s was when it was reported. And as we all know, the 1950s was a time when B-movie monsters were really popular, so you never know if someone was just making up a weird story about space monsters and uh, setting it in the past. So the source, to a degree, is Raymond Palmer, co-founder of Fate Magazine and also uh, Amazing Stories. He received this letter in the 1950s from a witness who said it happened back in the 1920s. The witness's name was Don Wood Jr., who uh, claimed that he had this experience in 1925. He and three other pilots were flying World War I-era monoplanes over the Nevada desert when they landed on Flat Mesa near Battle Mountain, Nevada. Uh, They say the mesa is about 5,000 square feet and the walls are too steep to climb up unless a lot of climbing work is done. So they just wanted to see what was on top of this mesa and they found this strange uh, creature kind of just floundering around. They said it was about 8 feet across and was round and flat like a flying saucer. Some people have said, you know, it kind of resembled clam or something and they said as it breathed, they would see, quote, the top would rise and fall, making a half foot hole all around it like a clam opening and closing. Again, this is a quotation from his letter. Quite a hunk had been chewed out of one side of the rim, and a sort of metal-looking froth issued. When it saw us, it breathed frantically and rose up only a few inches, only to fall back to the earth again. It was moist and glistened on the top side. We could see no eyes or legs. He also added that it had a shell-like body. And they said after about 20 minutes, a similar creature, actually, they observed it fly onto the mesa and land next to the smaller one, kind of like it. maybe it was like a parent and a child. They said it had four sucker-like tongues. They say that these tongues settled on the smaller one, and then the bigger one got so, quote, dazzlingly bright you couldn't look at it. Both rose straight up and were out of sight in a second and they must have been traveling a thousand miles an hour to get so high so fast and they left behind some sort of weird frothy metallic debris that looked kind of like fine aluminum so very very strange creatures that some have called living flying saucers for obvious reasons i'm sorry did you just say they leave behind like an aluminum powdery aluminum substance yes so it's like their exhaust Maybe, or or maybe Jesse can turn it into nanotechnology as the story progresses. We'll we'll see how we want to play with it. Oh, that would be fun. So that's just kind of our first element. We like to have a couple. Prior to the 1900s, they used to have these strange reports of rains of flesh and blood, of frogs, of snakes. 
There were just these strange, strange rains that don't happen anymore, which means one of two things. All of the stories were made up to begin with, or something changed and this doesn't happen anymore. But if you look it up online, there's quite a few reports that you can find of rains of blood and animals and other things just from antiquity. Or not knowing how to describe current events with modern science, like what we have seen in some cases where birds just fell out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. So that'd be raining birds, right? There's tons of articles we could read from, but I'm only gonna do uh, a couple so one of the better articles that I feel like can fit this story came from uh, the Little Rock Daily Republican, June 28, 1872, reporting on an event in Carroll Parish, Louisiana. The event itself took place in May of 1872, and in this case, fish bones rained from the sky. And this is a, the very short article. A heavy storm visited the parish, and during the storm, fish bones fell to the ground by the million. These bones seem to come from an exceedingly large black cloud. The shower of bones was attended by a very heavy fall of rain. This strange phenomena extended over a belt of country 10 miles in width by many miles in length. Specimens have been shown to experienced coast fishermen and also to learned ethiologists, but they are not able to ascertain to what particular kind of fish the bones belong. So very strange story, you know, about uh, fish bones running from the sky. And some people have actually speculated that maybe it uh, actually waste from one of these atmospheric beasts that had eaten some fish and then dropped the bones. Now, Jesse has a PhD in Earth's natural sciences, uh, specifically earthquakes, I believe you said. Yes, Jesse? Yes, earthquakes. So uh, we'll kick this over to you and let you start us off on this. Atmospheric beasts and raining blood or fish bones. Go. Okay, atmospheric beasts. It sounds fascinating, and I have seen it in a few places. I'm trying to remember the the books that I read with them in it. There are jellyfish-like beings that float around atmospheres. The concept is absolutely fascinating, and given the number of gaseous planets that are out there compared to rocky planets like Earth, it would seem more logical that biological formation would happen within one of these planets, especially one with plenty of energy from hot environments. So it does make a lot of sense if there is going to be life out there, which there are so many planets around so many stars and so many galaxies, that it's probably likely that one of these would be more likely to appear than something of our nature. There's a whole field of exobiology that I find absolutely fascinating, and it covers everything from microbiology and the ability for exoplanets to sustain life as we think of it versus things that are absolutely bizarre when we think about them from a humanistic point of view. Sometimes they're completely brainless in science fiction, and sometimes they are very smart types of beings that can surpass us in technology. So in science fiction, they've really taken off in a variety of different ways. It's absolutely a way to think about the resources that are in planets outside of Earth. If we think about the what you might call geography of the solar system, there's so much more area inside of one of these that you would end up ha could end up having a lot more life forms than on, on Earth. And a really interesting component is a lot like fish in the sea, where they don't just exist on the surface, they exist deep and shallow. And that there could be for this sort of atmospheric beast, a range of elevations in the pressure within the clouds that could, in theory, make it a pressure zone in terms of altitude within a planet that would be more ideal to sustaining life than another one. And so they could fight for survival by fighting for that depth range. 
So that helps build the world around our atmospheric beast and what we might be playing in from the science perspective. One of the things that I had in my head when we went down the idea that these could be situated in the atmospheres of gaseous giants, such as Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, or even Venus, right, is the nurses of a beehive caring for the larva. Mm -hmm. And so kind of a, a hive scenario. I don't know necessarily what to do that, but let's play like we have an alien race where either they have created or are these atmospheric beasts, which are, say, jellyfish-like looking, according to human perspective, and they live up in the atmosphere of some of these gaseous giants. These gaseous giants are incubation facilities for this alien race's larva. John? Mm, I like that, because that's I had no idea where to go with this one. And I feel like it's cheating when you just take it and make a giant monster move, movie out of it, because that's so easy to do. So, Well, I mean, that's late night cable. Yeah, but that's too, that's too easy for us. We like to make stuff that's a little more interesting. So I think my only flourishes would be, just because Jesse's into the nanotech, my idea is, so we since we play off the real world events... Uh, some scientist takes the metallic residue from those quote-unquote living flying saucers seen in 1925. And many years later, that's how he or they, they develop like this nanotechnology. And maybe they have to use that same nanotechnology to defeat these aliens that are using the atmospheric beasts. Or maybe, you know, maybe the atmospheric beasts don't even need a master. Maybe they're just the threat and they're these organisms that are going to feed on the earth and uh, destroy it or terraform it or whatever. But the nanotech developed from these remains, maybe that could play into the story. I don't know. What if this is a story where it is a symbiotic relationship and we don't mm. actually have a conflict between aliens and humans? Let's play off of the idea that this is all part of the, you know, multi hundred thousand or multi million year evolutionary process where these jellyfish beings go to this gaseous giant they have their hive the larva they plant their eggs or do whatever it is that they do okay they feed off of the energy da 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 and then during that process it terraforms say jupiter down into an earth-like planet mm. and through that process the excrement of these particular beasts okay drop all the precious metals and all of that stuff like aluminum and iron and, and gold and silver and mm. platinum and run, down into the earth and through also other say processes you get the primordial goo mm. that spawns the evolutionary process which eventually da -da -da -da, crescendo homo sapiens and we could tell a story kind of spanning the lifespan of a planet uh, or, or maybe they, maybe humanity's goal is to wrangle one of these beasts and clone it, and then use it to terraform Jupiter into something habitable for them. Jesse, thoughts? All fascinating concepts. I like the symbiotic relationship rather than necessarily a conflict. But then you have to come up with what the conflict is for a plot to exist, and you know that's there are all sorts of mechanisms for that like we're running out of energy so therefore the atmospheric beasts are dying off or there's a disease that they're all fighting against uh, in order to make the symbiotic relationship work and therefore they have to develop and implement nanotechnology into uh, these beasts to maintain their health okay uh, that's where my my brain went i've got an idea i want to pull off of what you had mentioned to me in the green room and that is the crispr technology so the crispr technology humanity comes to realize that the symbiotic relationship is critical for the evolutionary process or for whatever purposes the conflict then what if it's we have a situation where the planet is losing its atmosphere and we as humanity view technology as a tool and then we see these atmospheric beasts that we have kind of come to rely upon for other terraforming projects across the solar system, maybe the galaxy, 
And we use the CRISPR technology to try to change the DNA of these atmospheric beasts to reintroduce the proper oxygen-nitrogen ratio for humanity to exist on Earth. That's a fascinating concept of, you know, terraforming and restoring Earth's atmosphere to a more stable environment in case of global warming, uh, which is, again, another, you know, possibility that would be again, symbiotic. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Or if you want to go down the global warming route and still have the concept of a conflict, we find that the atmospheric beast traditionally across the solar system, they or in theory, scientific theory, right? They come in, they do their thing, they leave, then humanity evolves. But on Earth, we actually have some leftovers that never actually left. Oh. They, for whatever reason, wanted to stay. And so while they've stayed, they have slowly deteriorated the planet further to where our evolutionary process is now in jeopardy. And so humanity and these um, beings that are here on Earth, so it's not like humanity versus the species, right, outside of it. It's humanity versus, say, these five or six entities that are still here who've just never left, maybe they're cognitive of the, each other, or maybe they are cognitive of us, maybe they are not cognitive of us, or whatever. And humanity has come to the point where we don't want to, say, eliminate these beasts. We want to coexist with them, but we don't know how to communicate with them. So this is where we use the CRISPR technology to ensure that we've altered their DNA to where they're no longer capable of harming our atmosphere. So I feel like you you did the right thing, Will, because I was going to say we, uh, we've we got a goal in mind to terraform or whatever and save the planet, but we didn't really have like a conflict yet. So I think you kind of established the conflict. So maybe that's the source of global warming, right? You know, they, they are depleting certain elements of the ozone or our atmosphere, or, um, the planet's ability to maintain the proper uh, ratios and as a result, we realize that, you know, they're the, the source or the cause of part of the problem. Mm. And so we're trying to coexistively live with them. But at the same time, we've got to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's where the CRISPR technology comes in. And one possible adventure that would take, take a, a short story or a longer story, depending on how you worked on it, to capture these beasts and infuse them with the nanotechnology so that the nanotechnology then changes their genetics to be more symbiotic with our current environment and don't destabilize it. Uh, instead of capturing the creature, we do it innocuously. Oh. We use this 1950s technology from that old movie, right? We shrink ourselves and then we go up into this atmospheric beast. And we alter the DNA from the inside using this or, CRISPR Or maybe it's actually so huge that you don't even have to shrink yourself. And the, the ones that were cited were, like you said, just the, the smaller ones, but there's the big one up where we don't see it. Yeah. Or, oh, now here's an idea. What if we advance in our knowledge to the point that we realize the atmosphere itself is a living organism? Hmm. And it is this atmospheric beast. Ooh, interesting. And the planet is kind of like, you know, going a little bit back to that uh, um, world where the planet's a living, you know, creature, mm. you know, has a, I don't even remember what it's called, but Mother Earth. Okay, we'll just call it that, right? So you've got Mother Earth and Father Atmosphere. Mm. Okay, and then the children are these little babies, which were the ones, the beats that... The Crawfordsville monster. Right. And the, the, yeah. And throughout the process, these little beasts, they then go out into the universe... And, you know, fertilize other planets and humanity lives on Mother Earth, right? But exists between the, uh, the, the two entities of Mother Earth and Father Atmosphere, right? And we realize that Father Atmosphere is sick. Hmm. What kind of ending do you see, Jesse? Do you see a happy ending or one of those Planet of the, A Planet of the Apes type endings where the, the world ends? Or what do you think? Um, so... I think it ends with both sorrow and hope uh, would be how I would see it ending with sorrow for the earth because father atmosphere is dying as a result of what we've done 
but hope because we piggyback off of these these beasts and travel to other star systems and gain a new life in these other star systems with these beasts terraforming the lands to stuff that we can use. Oh, that's cool. We shrink ourselves or create these mini tiny Earths and we embed them or these baby Crawfordsville monsters, right? These baby beasts eat it. And then that's like the Earth seed for humanity to then go out into the universe. Instead of spaceships and like technology, we're using um, bioengineering. Yeah, that sounds fun. That is a fascinating concept. So you know what I liked about this one? You know, usually when I bring in my concepts, I have at least some idea where it's going to go. I had no idea where this one would go other than just bringing those concepts. But but I like that, for one, we took things from the Victorian era, the, the reigns of flesh and blood, the atmospheric beasts, and we made that like a futuristic space age thing. But I also like how we could take this concept, any of our concepts, and every one of our guest authors would put a unique spin on it. So Jesse, you definitely put a very unique spin on this by taking us from, again, Victorian era monsters and phenomena into like the space age and beyond. So that was really cool. I think I was feeding off of the Carl Sagan concept as, as, as well. Yeah, well, and for any listeners that really liked the idea of a movie about an atmospheric beast, there's one, and it comes from, maybe this shouldn't be a surprise, the same studio that created Godzilla, Toho in Japan. They made Dagora, the space monster, back in 1964, which is about this giant jellyfish from outer space that feeds on carbon. Sounds really silly, but it's scientifically speaking, it's a pretty good little thriller. It feeds on carbon, so it sucks up coal, and then it drops back diamonds to Earth. Or sometimes it'll feed on diamonds and, and recycle it as like carbon or something. But it, it was a unique little film. So if you like the idea of an atmospheric beast and you want to see a film, check out Dagora. And somewhere in the Star Force series, which is on Audible, I'm not sure about Kindle or other formats, there are atmospheric beasts in that novel series but they're somewhere embedded and it's like a hundred uh short book series so i wouldn't be able to tell you where all right well folks there you go atmospheric beasts raining blood flesh bones diamonds who knows it's up to you here with william atkinson john lemay and jesse f lawrence on the phone author of i nano the day after infinity and metal very fascinating stuff thank you for your time today jesse it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on today's episode thank you for having me it was uh it was lots of fun and jesse give us your socials if you would for our listeners i am at j f l here as in h e r e on most social networks twitter facebook reddit uh you name it excellent And folks, I'll have links in the description below, including affiliate links, which help support the channel to Jesse's works, iNano, Day After Infinity, and Metal. You can pick those up on Amazon. He has Kindle, Audible, as well as paperback and hardback available. The Metal Audible book will be coming out shortly. Jesse, I believe you had uh, mentioned sometime mid-March. Yeah, I'm excited for it to come out. Listening to it was fantastic. Excellent. We are out of time, but we will be back soon. Again, Jesse, thank you for your time today. Thanks again. And folks, if you're interested in submissions to the show, send us an email to submissions at plotpit.com. And folks, you can also join us on our Discord. We have a Discord channel. If you're interested, email me for a link at submissions at plotpit.com where you can interact with several authors, including our esteemed friend, Jesse. Thank you for joining the Discord server, Jesse. Of course. It's going to be fun. If you want to interact with Jesse, ask him questions about his books, his work, maybe some spoilers, if he'll give them to you, hit us up on Discord. William Atkinson here with John LeMay. And you've been listening to Plot Pit, where we forge fiction from fact and folklore.